Perfect. Okay, just before we kick off here, uh, I just wanna say welcome. Um, and uh, just for this panel, we have a uh, very short content warning. Um, just so you're aware, this panel contains discussion of sexual violence, uh, both in myth and in reality. Um, this is a content warning, but we are encouraging people to have an open and honest engagement with this topic. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to John and we can get started. Uh, thank you, Eleanor, and um, welcome everybody to panel two. Um, my name is John Davies. I lecture in classics at Maynooth University, um, and I will be the moderator for this panel. Um, and I think before I do anything else, um, I should introduce our um, eight panelists, um, whose brilliant papers you've no doubt all um, been entranced by over this past week. Um, we can start off with um, Carly Silver whose paper was entitled Sisters in Outlaw, How Sororal Strife of the Mari Letters Shines a Light on Ancient Women. Um, Caroline Bristow's paper was entitled Breaking Silence with Classical Myths and Stories. Imaho Hamlin spoke on uh, of blockheads and gatekeepers, the secret her story of classical tourism. Great title, by the way. Um, we have uh, Natalie Shubinet, um, who spoke on less revisited corners of classics, what we study when we study ancient Greek dance. Um, Rachel Cornwell, uh, what use is a dead language to the living? Uh, Zavir Gertin um, spoke on closing the circle, the life cycle of a comic styled public archaeology project. Um, and uh, one of our organizers today, Ralph Moore, uh, Voices Lost to Silence, question mark, Truth, Lies and Lost Perspectives in Caesar's De Bello Gallico and its receptions. Um, and lastly, and in no way least, um, another one of our organizers today, uh, Lisa Doyle, uh, What Have the Scolia Ever Done for Us? Uh, contemporary Readings of Ancient Critical Discourses. Um, and um, I have to begin with a confession of failure, I'm afraid. I, I consider it part of my job to try and find a theme which can unite all of these papers as a good basis for the start of the discussion. Um, and I wasn't able to. These were, uh, this was an incredibly diverse array of papers. Um, but I did identify a theme which seems to be a common preoccupation with many of them, with most of them. Um, and that is the recovery, the reconstruction, uh, the reimagining and the recentering of marginalized or silenced or lost perspectives. It seemed the majority um, of our papers in one way or another um, touched on that theme. Uh, so I want to begin with a general question um, and any of our panelists can jump in on this as the spirit moves you. Um, Oh, I, I should also have said, incidentally, that you are, of course, for anyone who wasn't here during panel one, um, you are, of course, welcome to submit your own questions. Um, and there are two ways to do that. Um, you can either type them into chat um, or you can uh, go into the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen um, and um, press the uh, raised hand button and that will let us know that you have a question. Um, introductory general question relating to marginalized and lost perspectives. Um, any of you can answer on this. Um, what I wanted to ask is how central do you think it should be uh, to 21st century scholars of the ancient world, uh, this whole process of uh, recentering marginalized voices? Um, and to tie that in with the conference's theme, um, what do you think it means or could mean to a broader modern audience outside academia to be exposed to lesser known stories, perspectives and voices uh, from the ancient world? Uh, quite a big question, but does anyone, uh, Natalie, you're, um, uh, go ahead, please. I managed to mute myself. <laughs> so, um, hello everyone. And um, I just wanted to uh, kind of connect our previous discussion. Uh, that was very interesting. And I thought it was, uh, again, about inclusivity in classics, uh, because people were talking about how relevant or applicable it is to teach and learn classics in different countries and for different people. And um, so uh, that made me think, because judging from the answers, sorry, I got a little bit confused about um, the, our definition of classics on the whole. 
because it seemed to me that for some people, classics is just looking to Greek and Roman cultures. And whereas for the others, it seemed to me, including myself, classics has a more umbrella meaning of looking into ancient history, archaeology, or even history in its broader sense. So the, well, I think the better applicability, of course, of classics will be when we look at it in the closest connection to ancient history. And um, when we look at it from this view, we can see that the classics um, must become applicable, not only to different cultures, but also to different needs of the new society of the modern times. And for myself, uh, whatever that is um, occupation or preoccupation of people um, today can be uh, an important topic in classics. Um, so you know that my uh, most uh, well, work actually revolves around dancing. And since dance was so uh, ever present in different layers of ancient life, and it wasn't separated from uh, lots of things. It was part of um, ritual, and ritual is something that we do every day. So if looking from this uh, angle, you can see that um, if we manage to centralize the importance of ritual, the applicability, the relevance of ritual to everyday life, then we can talk about the importance of its components as well. So to me, uh, they're all connected. It's the kind of network and it all can become true if we think about classics in more general terms. Thank you. Um, I see Caroline, um, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I was going to say, so for your question about the importance of centralising marginalised voices and what that speaks to, I think one of the things that comes out of a lot of us who work with the more marginalised uh, voices is what forces created the marginalisation. And voices at the time they well some of them were marginalized at the time anyway i'm thinking enslaved people obviously but a lot of these voices weren't marginalized um if you think about it they, they weren't at the, at the time they were just voices and uh over millennia we've made decisions which have led to marginalization and losing of these voices so and i think that process is incredibly important to understand um both as historians or classicists or uh, Egyptologists or whoever we are, whatever, whatever discipline we want to identify ourselves with. It's important for us to understand that because it means that we can then interrogate what voices have reached us and how that has happened. And I think that's incredibly important, you know, just from an academic point of view. But it also hopefully encourages people to think about today which voices are being privileged or marginalized or um, twisted a little. You know, my own work, um, it's, it's what's really interesting for me is the previous panel's discussion uh, felt very much like my day job. Uh, that's literally what I do. I talk about languages uh, in schools. And then my research is the bit that's a bit more kind of like, I, I go off on a little kind of less relevant to my day job sort of tangent. Um, but the two things, the reason that I started engaging with sexual violence um, is I really noticed how much when people write about sexual violence, I mean, obviously, mo you know, um, I come at it from a, a personal point of view as a survivor of violence. And it really rings with me the fact that people often the people who are writing about survivors aren't survivors. Sometimes they are, but often they're not. And actually, um, this is going to sound like a really odd connection, <laughs> um, but I was really struck listening to Natalie's paper because um, when I was young, I'm six foot tall, and that's the only reason I'm not a dancer. Um, I spent my entire life intending to be a dancer, then reached six foot and was told, essentially, give it up, girl. Um, and but 
I've really noticed my my agency research back way right back before I ran away screaming from academia the first time um, was actually on uh, orgiastic cult and dance. And I was really struck again by the fact that so many people who write about dance aren't dancers. And you can tell the way they write about movement. And I think that's happened so often as you've got the reason voices can get lost or distorted is often the person who's writing about them isn't of that great. You don't need to be. But sometimes in order to understand the effect of dance on the body, you need to have danced. You know, it, it's just a thing. And so I think that's also contributing to that marginalization. You know, so often the people who have written the history simply aren't connecting with the people they're writing about. Thank you. And that does, um, if, if I'm permitted to ask a sort of follow up, that does actually relate to something that occurred to me while I was watching your paper um, on using uh, the power of Greek mythical na uh, narratives to sort of challenge modern rape myths. Um, and um, one thing that did occur to me is that there is a specific case, um, particularly with older children, uh, where teachers aren't in the fortunate position of being able to teach these stories as free floating stories, rather they teach them as um, episodes within a set text. Text. And because this is classical literature we're talking about, very often those set texts are themselves saturated with forms of rape myths and with very problematic views of uh, consent and sexual violence. Um, and I was wondering, just on the off chance that we might have some classical teachers watching, um, what advice would you give? Um, to um, classical teachers uh, who uh, want to use these myths to explore and problematize uh, difficult narratives, but they're obliged to do so through texts which are themselves very problematic. Okay, so, I mean, you may have to stop me because I will get overexcited and just be like, oh my lord! Um, so, at a start point, um, and this is something I've said, so I actually also, as well as my sort of day job, um, I uh, also lecture, I work in the Faculty of Education, and so for the last few years I've gone into PGCE, uh, teacher training for those not in the UK, uh, sessions with uh, teacher trainees across all subjects, and I essentially do a session with them where I sit there as a 35 year old woman and say essentially, right, I am a survivor of violence, the first, I don't want the first survivor of violence you meet to be a terrified child, come at me. And, um, you know, I get them to ask me all the things that they're worried about, or they're thinking about. And that uh, one of the biggest messages that I give in that session is don't be an idiot, essentially. Um, there is a lot of pain when you're handling uh, sexual violence. And I think teachers, lecturers, all of us in society, um, Sometimes when we bring something that resonates with someone and it's that kind of pain, we feel that we blame ourselves or that we create blame. We either attach it to the victim because we don't want to self-blame or we bring it to ourselves. There is blame around violence and it belongs in one place. It belongs with perpetrators. So that blame that wants to come here or go to the victim actually needs to be very carefully placed on the perpetrator at all times. So talking to your point about working with texts, um, it's actually unpicking this. And uh, Amy Hines made, makes a really, really good point in her work. Uh, there's an article on Idolin called Rape, uh, Rape or Romance that she did that I really, it really resonates with me. I think it's brilliant. And she makes the point of actually often the text isn't doing it, it's us. When we translate or we work with the text, so for example, Ovid, Ovid's pretty damn, um obvious about what's going on he has he, you know the, the latin the latin's there it's when you um it's when you kind of translate it and suddenly it becomes seduction or she was overcome she was what now um and so yeah for me what i'd say is when teachers are working with these texts, I mean, for starters, if you haven't got time to properly create a space with your room and work with these texts, don't, don't use them. You know, that's cool, that's fine. You know, if you're really up against it curriculum wise, pick a non-problematic text. That's, I totally respect that. My, my big mantra is if you're gonna do it, do it properly. Um, there are a couple of textbooks out there. Obviously I'm a textbook writer. Um, I have views, um, 
a textbook recently came to my attention because its first introduction of Lucretia just describes uh, the Romans overthrowing their kings due to the behavior of the king's son. Bam, that's it. And it's like, mm, okay, that's a, that's a decision. Um, and then later on, the king's son is described as intending to seduce Lucretia. And no, no, if you're going to put that myth in your textbook, do it properly. Also, don't just introduce it as a passage for translation. That happens in a different textbook I'm aware of. She just kind of, the rape of Lucretia just turns up in the middle of a passage. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like, you need to be framing this for your kids. You need to be working with it. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm aware that I'm going on far too long and uh, everyone else needs to speak. But yeah, essentially, uh, this is something that I'm currently writing some stuff to go on my work blogs and stuff that I want to publish. It's essentially around, you know, just really paying attention to what the text is doing and the decisions that you're making as a practitioner. Are you creating a narrative that's not there? And actually, the text is creating a narrative that can be recognised as um, a victim blaming narrative or something that you think, actually, let's really unpick this and really use this. You know, take the time to do it. Don't just be like, OK, Ovid does something really problematic here. Moving on. Um, you know, it's balancing that. And I think actually accept that if you don't have time to do that in your classroom, that's OK. You know, just maybe think about how you structure your curriculum. So I don't know how helpful that is, but thank you very much. I'm sure that was very, very helpful. <laughs> Certainly, I was I was uh, fascinated and in violent agreement with all of that. So thank you, um, uh, Natalie. Your hand is up. Um. Well, uh, thank you very much, Caroline. That was really fascinating. First of all, um, I just wanted to go through two points well it was one but after your talk it became two but very quickly because we want to look at the others as well uh, so the first one was about you telling that um yes lots of people who write about dance are not dancers and i really consider it as a kind of pathologic issue in scholarship and it is a matter of question for me that why people if you want to write about ancient Greek music you need to know music at least to some extent but why uh, the same uh, criteria is not applicable to dance you need to be not a professional dancer but at least you need to have a hands-on experience of dance to feel it to know what you're talking about or else well <laughs> it's a bit hopeless and um, the other one was an interesting uh, point about uh, the, how to teach about the rape, because um, as uh, I find it in ancient Greek context, and I think I talked about it very briefly in my presentation, there is a very close connection between uh, rape and uh, amorosity. So rape to, well, to ancient male-centered culture was uh, first of all uh, functioned as a well sorry about the word uh, as a kind of well um let's put it that way rom-com so a kind of romantic story most of times and so that's why it's so mingled with dancing so lots of princesses were abducted when they were dancing in their sanctuary to Artemis or in another temple. So there's a very close connection between the two. It wasn't a disaster at all. Quite the contrary, it was very productive. And it seems that lots of those um, painters, Athenian painters, wanted to show that the, this and that princess from this and that Demos was uh, chased and raped by Theseus, okay, now we have a claim to the ancestry to be Athenian. Well, we are a kind of Athenian, so uh, the citizenship is applicable to us as well. They were trying to connect themselves. So it is very different from what we understand today as a rape, as a disaster. No, it was very different. And I think if you want to teach it with better, teach it in its context. Um, well, I think it's a very uh, big discussion. So should we teach it 
uh, as we understand it or as the ancients uh, used to understand it. So, um, sorry, I don't, <laughs> I don't go further. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, we've had a very interesting question from Sarah McKeegney, which I want to get to in a moment, but I have been told that we've got some technical issues. Um, Carly wishes to speak, but can't seem to raise her hand. Um, so um, I'll bring Carly in at this point. Um, so um, yes, uh, please, Carly. Thank you so much. I'm not sure where the raise my hand button is. It seems to have disappeared. Go going off of both of those wonderful points, one thing that I tried to keep in mind when I was researching the source material for my presentation was that I was working in translation. So not only was I working outside of a time period in which my own expertise lay, and I was aware of that, but I was also working you know, that much more removed from the material with, um, that I was studying. So in the case of public history, it's a very interesting way in which you, know, you can interpret sources because you obviously want to engage an audience and pull out the relatable things, but you also want to be able to add those caveats of, you know, this may or may not have been the circumstances in which people found themselves, you know, so you can try and relate to the individual, the modern day individual, but I'm also aware that I'm not only working in translation, so the meaning and nuance can be skewed, but I'm also extrapolating meaning by trying to relate it to the modern day individual. And that of course goes through for any, when any of us try and relate anything to the modern day, it by nature is out of context. But for me, I, you know, the way my work situates itself means that I, by, by its very nature, tend to make myself that much more removed. And it's interesting because there does, by that, that problem also creates an interesting fictive kinship between the reader or the viewer in the case of this presentation and the subject. So in this talk, the princesses of Mari are going through a sisterly struggle and I wanted the, the reader to feel the angst that they're undergoing. And that's part of the way in which I, as the architect of that talk was manipulating the way in which I was presenting the information because I had a thesis. But at the same time, whenever any information is presented from any voice, it, it is, you know, it is, there is a context in which it's produced and you can't, you know, so, so acknowledging that I think in my case was something I made, I wanted to make sure that I did because I, as much as, as relatable as these things may seem, you know, it doesn't serve my purpose to be talking about, well, here are the actual additional archeological context in which it doesn't make sense necessarily, but there are additional, many, many additional factors to consider in which when you present something that is, um, that is, nothing is timeless in that way. Everything is a product of its own time and of many factors, many of which none of us, we may not even know it, it, at any given time. So it's, I just wanted to add that to the already wonderful discussion. Thank you. Um, and that actually ties in quite nicely with some of the comments that um, Sarah has made in chat. Um, so um, Sarah raises the point that when we talk about marginalized voices in history, um, it's always worth asking what we mean by that. And in particular, and I think this also intersects with some comments that Caroline made, um, who's doing the marginalization? When we talk about marginalized voices in history, um, are these always people who were marginalized in, in the cultures we're studying? Or to what extent is it us doing the marginalizing of certain voices? Um, and Sarah, ends with a big question, how do we fight anachronism? Um, and um, I, I think on that point, actually, um, I'd like to bring Ralph in, um, because um, one uh, area which you began to explore in your paper um, is, if you like, the dangers and the pitfalls um, of reconstructing and recentering marginalized voices um, on the basis of limited or even no evidence. Uh, you talked, for example, about how um, nationalists in France um, have used the uh, reimagined perspectives of Vercingetorix. Um, so I, I, I wanted to ask, what do you as a historian think are the potential dangers and pitfalls um, of uh, recreating marginalized perspectives um, and how can we do it responsibly uh, and avoid some of those nefarious misappropriations um, of uh, the classical past uh, as we go about this? 
I think you're still muted, yes, Ralph. Yes, there we oh, are. There we go. Thank you. Um, thank you to both John and for Sarah for an excellent question and for bringing me into the discussion. Um, that is a very uh, difficult point that we uh, have to deal with with the historiography of people who don't have written histories of their own. As I mentioned in my talk, one of in, to maybe answer part of the question in terms of who's doing the marginalizing and how does it work. Um, when working with um, the Gauls as a community like I do um, for my research when until a lot later um, in late antiquity when you have people who are Gauls who start writing in Latin and have those texts preserved um, preserve much more than others. Um, if you have some uh, people who are only written about by others, so by Romans like Caesar or Greeks like Strabo, um, you always have to have that decentered perspective. And so you have to read between the lines of, okay, we have this info, but we don't know how far it applies to some people. Is this a stereotype? Is this, you know, something else? So one of the issues that comes up particularly with Gallic ethnography is that um, there is a great lost source for it in the, um, the Greek philosopher um, Posidonius. But one of the problems is in trying to reconstruct what he actually wrote um, based on fragments of other ones. A lot of people have suggested, well, he only really seems to have seen like one very tiny area of Gaul at a very unusual time. So a lot of what he says about the Gauls as a people who cover you know, quite a large area and are quite diverse only really applies to this one very tiny area and we can't take it as red um, in many ways. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up about the nefarious points is that uh, yesterday um, I was able to go to a lecture by Kelly Wen, who is uh, a doctoral candidate at Brown University, who delivered this amazing paper about the reception of De Bella Gallica and Caesar and the idea of the Gauls, um, not simply in French nationalism, but French imperialism and colonialism in North Africa and especially Vietnam, where this idea of um, the Gauls as a people who were conquered by the Romans, but then assimilated into them um, and became this great you know, French um, nation. So this civilization that uh, was birthed out of the union of um, conqueror and conquered and then attempts to apply that to other areas. So you will become like us. And then also um, issues with that um, not necessarily working or you know, being rejected when, okay, you know, you know these Vietnamese, they're becoming very good at um, Greek and Latin and French, and you know, they might actually you know, outcompete us. So we're going to um, apply a lot of racialization onto that idea of no, these people, you know, because they're not Europeans, they can't um, do the same thing. But um, in terms of how do we fight anachronism and how do we avoid these nefarious purposes, I think one of the things that I always want to do is try and center the idea of imperialism. There is this huge power dynamic. We can't just assume that any um, information that we get is factual, that it's not filtered through um, political agendas by people like Caesar, by people like Strabo. And um, while we can't necessarily reconstruct a kind of authentic voice out of nothing for the people who are being marginalized, we can at least look at what they've left behind in terms of material culture, in terms of um, the way that they behave and try and see, okay, well, what would this be like? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd like to move on and bring in Ema into this discussion. In fact, we just had a question for Ema, um, so maybe you could tackle this um, as well as a question of my own. Um, so uh, Miguel in the comments asks, um, in your presentation, you talk about some spaces as they were viewed and described in the past. Are you aware of any works which compare those same spaces with the new versions available in our own day and age? Um, and the other question that um, I would like to ask if you could consider uh, on top of that, if it's not too much to ask, um, is relating to this issue of marginalization. These, um, these fantastic sounding women writers that you introduce us to in your paper um, have been marginalized in the sense that their contribution to travel literature has not historically been recognized in the same way as male travel writers have. Um, I was curious if you could say something about their contemporary reception. Um, when um, people back in the 18th century read these works, um, did they read them differently uh, because they were aware that they were written by women? Is there any evidence of a, a, a gendered reception of these authors um, in their own time? Um, or is that a case of marginalization that's been retrospectively applied by less, later generations who don't think these writers are as important because they're women? Um, yeah, no, thank you for the two of those questions. They're both really interesting. Um, I'll just look at um, Miguel's question first. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, I haven't actually looked at any of this research uh, necessarily in terms of comparing 
18th century archaeological sites with 21st century archaeological sites. Um, but I do think there are there are some really interesting questions um, to ask. So, for example, when Pompeii was first being excavated um, in, in the 18th century, there was a, a sort of embargo on making sketches, uh, sort of unofficial sketches of the site um, from the King of Naples, I believe. And one of the writers who I look at, he's called Jane Waldy, who I mentioned briefly in the presentation, she makes a note of this in her travel works. Um, she, she, she says, you know, we weren't allowed to sketch when we went there, but she's an artist and she says she kind of kept all the images in her head. And then as soon as she went home, she made sketches of what she'd seen. Um, and it's really frustrating because I don't, I don't know where these sketches are. I don't even know if they still exist in an archive somewhere, but I would just absolutely love to see them because I think it would be fascinating to see to see these sketches that she made up based on her memories of what she had seen when she went to visit these sites. Um, but uh, I, in, ter in terms of your question, John, I think what's really interesting from what I found in my research, which is about Irish and British women's reception of classical statues in the 18th century, is that a lot of a lot of the best sources for these receptions come in travel literature and travel logs, which were published really widely in this period. They were a really popular form of literature. And um, it was very commercially successful as well. Um, and this didn't, it, there wasn't necessarily a gendered difference in whose works were popular and whose weren't. Um, in fact, one of the earliest travel writers, Mary Wortley Montague, who had traveled to the Ottoman Empire, she kind of carved this really important place for women in travel literature because she was visiting the Ottoman Empire. So she was, a, she was able to access um, these kind of female only spaces and write about her experiences in them in a way that um, no man who was traveling to the Ottoman Empire could. So from the beginning, there's kind of this uh, division between or not division necessarily, but there's a special place carved out for women travel writers um, and their uh, contributions and the, co the commentary that they produced was seen as very valuable. But I think it's more of a a modern uh, kind of constraint that we don't look at these works because they're sort of lumped into this category of travel literature, which sometimes can seem a bit like it can seem a bit repetitive because all these people are going to the to to, to visit the same to the same spots and they're kind of saying stuff that's is broadly sometimes similar um, and isn't necessarily classical reception in an obvious way. So I think in terms of our discipline I think we absolutely marginalize these women not necessarily deliberately but just because as classicists we're not aware of all of the the intricacies of genre in the 18th century and that's not our fault it's just sort of what we've been trained um what what we've been trained in but I do see this partly as tying into what Caroline was saying about um this idea that um scholars who write about ancient dance often do not dance themselves and I think I think a lot of the time the the scholarship that we produce in classics it comes from our own training and tying back to the first talk because of all these access problems in classics the class the classicist academic often sort of embodies a certain type of person and that's why it's so important to bring in kind of all these other perspectives that we only get when we broaden out the field um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's a um, very, uh, very interesting, um, very interesting answer. Um, I'd like to turn to Sophia now, if I may. Um, and um, one of the uh, issues which arose in your presentation, which I was, uh, I found interesting, um, was uh, well, it was your thoughts on uh, representation. Um, in this comic book about life in um, Iclanum. Um, and you talked about the importance of representing traditionally underrepresented groups in Roman life, like enslaved people, uh, like women, particularly like uh, women uh, relating to women's religious experience. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was wondering if you've had the opportunity to do any follow-ups on how these comics were uh, received uh, by particularly the local students in Oklahoma, uh, and whether any of them were surprised um, when they saw uh, the uh, increased representation of uh, certain groups and phenomena in your comic, uh, which is maybe different to what they're more used to um, from representations of the Roman world. Right. So it was actually fairly interesting. The um, As a female classical archaeologist slash comic book illustrator, I made early decisions that would involve, from my perspective, telling a woman's story or a young woman's story and using as many touchstones of females within her community as I could bring into it. Um, and I just thought it was interesting based on the epigraphy of the site that there were so many women in involved in um, multiple cults at once or really interesting cults to me as a person who studies cults. So that was my my own series of interests uh, showing up there a little bit. But the unfortunately due to COVID, we haven't had a lot of the in-classroom sort of feedback we were hoping for. Um, the materials were made in Italian, downloadable, free, printable. We gave out uh, hundreds of copies. So there was an initial, like we could see the children reading them on the open day at the initial dispersal um, with their parents. And they ranged from very small children to uh, just young teenagers, just because who, you know, whoever showed up, but usually it was quite smaller, younger children. And at no point did anybody bat an eye that the, there was, there was, there was almost like, a, a bit of a disappointing lack of surprise. <laughs> um, uh, the and and it, I think initial discussions had some. Like, oh well, are the boys going to be interested in it as much? And I'm like, I guarantee you, they will be. Like, I, I, I don't have any evidence to support this it going into this project. But I had a sense that if you just show interesting things and it's a captivating enough story that like everybody will find some touchstones for themselves within it that they're interested in, um, and so. I'm still sort of, I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully this year to finding out with the supplementary materials I've been working on, which do things like, um, like several activity sheets, which are just focused on women who had professions in the Roman world. And so it introduces you to all different types of women, very, very briefly, because they're activity sheets. Um, and then it puts a face, a name, a tiny story, and then a bit of a geographic spread. And then the next sheets are the enslaved women who were in this story. And, you know, what, what are their jobs? How do they relate? And, and it's, it involved a, a few discussions going into it, like, these are for children. So how do I want to present it and use like the appropriate language and all that stuff. So um, I am very curious to see what the, like, are these going to be things that teachers feel comfortable once they get back into the classroom? Is it going to be as useful as our original discussion sort of led me to think it would be? Um, and the, the, there's a few other supplementary um, activities involving like more abstract concepts like marble trade networks and, um, and local religion. And I think those for a small community and, and as well people interested more broadly are, are interesting things to think about because it's not it's not quite such a narrow view or such an easy view of, of larger topics. And especially in terms of um, enslaved people's stories and, and incorporating them into the material. Um, I wanted, I, there, there was a lot of like subtle things that I included and choices that I made. And that reflect, of course, as we've been discussing earlier, like with the context that you're creating these things in and your own personal, the things that move you as a creator, especially. Um, so yeah, that would be my. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it would be fascinating to, to, to see the feedback that you do get when you are uh, in a position to collect it. Um, Lisa, maybe coming to you now. Um, your talk was very much about um, recentering within classical scholarship, the traditionally marginalized uh, scholia. Um, and it does occur to me, we've been talking about marginalization as something that is done to people and groups so far by others, uh, whether that's within ancient society itself um, or by us as scholars when we neglect certain areas um, and focus and, and privilege other areas. Um, it occurs to me that in some ways the scolia are self-marginalizing um, in the sense that the scolia don't even put themselves front and center. They, they exist to serve and comment on other texts. Um, I wonder, is it inevitable then that uh, people are going to see the scolia as being sort of secondary and ancillary to the text on which they comment? Um, and, and how would you convince a skeptical audience that these texts deserve to be front and center? Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, it is an interesting tension 
you know, we don't need to look far or think hard about why Scoli are marginalized. You can literally quite find them. You find them in the margins of manuscripts, you know, but it's the Scolia for me, and it, it touches upon what we've been talking about. It's all about context. And also the Scolia are a great, great window into reception. And as someone who I've been fascinated by ancient Greek literature and scholarship, they can tell us so, so much. My argument, I mean, I would hope that, as you said, Scolia have been treated very much as an ancillary process. My hope is that more work will be done within scholarship to treat these corpora as, as texts in and of themselves. Because I firmly believe they're, yes, they are m marginal random notes, but in the corpus I'm working on, they've come from three to four commentaries, cohesive works with pedagog pedagogical intentions um, and educative function. So by creating perhaps critical evaluations of uh, particular corpora of scolia by, by focusing as I am on, on one corpus, I know a lot of work is being done on the Homeric scolia as well. You're then providing this kind of tool to scholars and students at all stages of their career um, who when engaging with scholarship and scolia and wondering what how, how this particular idea was received in antiquity you're not just taking one note in isolation or if you do you're given a better indication of how that note is indicative of what is said in the whole corpus because really my, my argument is that by taking these notes and looking at line 700 of a poem and then seeing what the ancient commentator says at that line you're actually going to reach quite an unsatisfactory conclusion now obviously for a lot of people scolia is not the focus of their work but it is becoming m more popular f within academia and that by producing this kind of work it can enhance people's readings of, of these ancient texts and in terms of perspectives when we as we all know reflect on 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 classical literature and, and, and how much we know and what survives to us, it is a shockingly small percentage and that all of these um, fragmentary minor authors who, who we don't know a lot about, we can really, really build our picture of how authors understood each other in antiquity. My, my own particular corpus is connected to the scholarship that was going on at Alexandria, which I find fascinating. So that's my own motivation there, but they can really open a window. And also this, this idea of um, anachronism, and there is this pro problem with scolia. It's a complex process of transmission and reception you're looking at, but also, for example, at the moment, I'm looking at rhetorical criticism and looking at what rhetorical principles and the, this idea of persuasion and when the critic is persuaded um, by the poem I'm working on. These principles were taught very consistently from the Hellenistic period to the Byzantine period. So you're not actually dealing so much or running into, into these kind of problems of who, who is this reflecting, this, this principle and this theory. They, it's a consistent, um, consistently taught in an educational setting over centuries. And the scolia are a great window into that. And of course, these criteria and these principles being taught so consistently over such a long period of time have undoubtedly influenced how we evaluate and approach literature today. So yeah, that would be my argument. My hope is that it, by, by people doing more work um, like this, it, it will that will be the argument to other academics and help them in their process of engaging with ancient literature. And like I said in my presentation, I'm fully aware that you know, looking at this kind of work, it, the product of elite scholarly circles and individuals. But my hope is that this doesn't mean that the people who work on it need to be restricted and that if more academics become interested in it it will generate public interest as well because i do obviously i'm doing a phd on it but guys i think they're pretty fascinating so <laughs> thank you excellent thanks very much um uh, i think we just have time for a question for rachel who's been sitting there incredibly patiently all this time so thank you for your patience um and i'm afraid this is a question that is just born out of my own curiosity um, and profound ignorance i'm afraid of anything to do with linguistics um it doesn't particularly relate to marginalization but um, I'd, I'd be fascinated to hear your answer to this nonetheless um the uh, you, you talk a lot about the um uh, the, the linguistic cycle, um, and you, you present it as being a sort of universal or near universal, a very common feature across a, a huge range of languages, um, including your central case study uh, of ancient Egyptian. Um, do you have any thoughts, has there been any scholarship out there about the internal logic uh, of the linguistic cycle? Um, why uh, is this such a, a universal feature across so many different languages, uh, this sort of vacillation between analyticization and synthesization? Why do we see it over and over again in so many different linguistic and cultural contexts? 
Thank you. That's a really interesting question. And um, there has been a bit of work into it. Um, the thing with the linguistic cycle is it's, it's something that hasn't actually been looked into that much, hence the scope for me to do a PhD on it. Um, and a lot of the work into it has just been on sort of the same constructions as um, the development of future tenses and from Latin to French is looked at particularly frequently, it's always mentioned, whereas the Egyptian examples, which has a huge, like we see the linguistic cycle in every single verbal construction and loads of other constructions in Egyptian, but this hasn't been looked into so much and um, this kind of, kind of ties into the marginalization um, aspect of, from a linguistics point of view, ancient languages such as Egyptian don't get looked into quite so much, even when they do show these amazingly like in-depth examples that can tell us so much. So this kind of hasn't been considered so much into being able to give us this answer of why this linguistic cycle is created, but this has been something I've been able to look into into my thesis. And my kind of perspective is that um, it's a change between what's been referred to by um, Martin Haspel and as some of his um, maxims that are important in, in why languages change. So there's the idea of um, clarity and extravagance. So kind of talking in the most extravagant way possible to kind of get yourself out there, make sure people notice you and what you're saying. But then there's also the maxim of economy. So kind of talking as like efficiently as possible. possible. So saying what you want to say in as few words as possible. And I think the kind of alternation between these is what we see in why the linguistic cycle is created. So when we see these increases towards a more analytic forms, these are usually um, sort of an increase in trying to make what you're saying clearer, trying to make it more extravagant, trying to make your language more noticeable. And you, that's why you get these forms with kind of more elements in and they're longer and they take longer to say. But once they kind of get to this point, at some point they're gonna get too long and you can't just you can't just talk and talk and talk for days to say one essentially what you could say what we'd say in one sentence. So that's when we start going back the other way towards more synthetic forms, which are kind of losing elements, they're shorter, everything's kind of closer together. And that's kind of speech trying to be made clearer, um, not clearer, sorry, more economic and um kind of trying to say what you want to say as with as least the least effort possible so essentially the linguistic cycle I think is created as a kind of alternation between wanting to to be as clear as possible and then re realizing you want to then say what you would say as economically as possible and you can't do both of these things at once these things kind of they don't balance well if you're trying to make yourself clearer you're then getting less economic and vice versa. So that's why we kind of see the alternation between going one way and then going the other way. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your response. Um, I think just glancing down at our organisers that we are probably uh, up against time now. Does that sound right? Um, and it's lunch uh, next, so I wouldn't want to keep anyone away from that. But um, I would certainly like to thank everybody uh, for your questions and comments in the chat. And in particular, um, I would like to thank our panellists, of course, for their fascinating papers on YouTube and for their willingness to come here and discuss them with us today um, in what I think was a very uh, productive and interesting discussion that illuminates many um, aspects of uh, uh, less familiar uh, voices, stories and experiences uh, from or about the ancient world. So thank you all very much um, and uh, enjoy your lunch, everyone. Hi, everyone. We'll uh, be back at uh, two o'clock, but we'll actually leave this open in case people still want to be chatting in the chat.